Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to um, the convocation lecture. Uh, my name is Martin Farr. I'm a, a senior lecturer in contemporary British history here at Newcastle. Um, it's been a great pleasure to be here with you today and to uh, introduce the lecture and chair the uh, conversation and discussion afterwards, of which there, there will, I'm sure, be much. We are delighted to uh, have with us today one of the most prominent um, broadcasters and journalists in British politics over the last 30 years, I would say, uh, who is someone you'll be familiar with from television, from radio. Um, and more than that, I was saying this before, um, uh, our speaker is unique in also having a public live experience, uh, rock and roll politics in the Edinburgh Fringe. Um, you do, and we had mentioned this before, you did a, briefly that panel quiz with Patrick Cormack oh, and Roy Hattersley on Radio yeah. 4, yeah, yeah. Anorak, slightly sorts of programmes, but going beyond the normal realms of writing about politics to actually engaging with a much wider public uh, and indeed in live events, very unusual, and also mastering uh, the form of podcasts with his Rock and Roll Radio podcast, which you can subscribe to on your podcast provider. Um, he's working at the BBC originally, uh, has been political correspondent, political editor of the New Statesman, uh, widely published in The Guardian, The Independent, um, and Week in Westminster presenter, presents my favourite version of the Week in Westminster, where he has three other political journalists on discussing the year um, and making predictions as we used to, but now making predictions is rather unwise. That's that part's been very hazardous. Dropped from the, from the show. Um, and he's speaking to us today on the, on the subject of trust in an age of globalization. Please would you welcome Steve Richards. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming or watching uh, virtually if you are and defying train strikes and everything else. Um, if it's okay with you, I'll talk for a bit and then we can have a wider discussion on the very rich theme of trust in politics uh, within the context of the sort of globalized era that we are living through. And again, if it's all right with all of you, what I will do is just explore for a moment or two uh, what trust means in the context of politics, because in ways I suspect some of you might disagree with me, I think it is misapplied quite often and misunderstands the nature of politics as a vocation. So I will begin by trying to define the terms and then look at the way things have changed and broken down to some extent uh, since the sort of globalized economic era, most specifically rooting it in 2008 and the financial crash, which Gordon Brown, the then prime minister, described as the first big economic crisis of the global era, which did all sorts of weird things in relation to trust and politics. Um, but first of all, let me explore the term because this isn't new, this sense of a breakdown of trust between voters and certain brands of politician. It's always been around and quite often in ways that show a complete misunderstanding of the way politics works. Let me give you an example from what voters often say uh, when you speak to them about politicians. And they quite often say, you know, in these Vox Pops the BBC do uh, in Basildon or somewhere, you know, why don't they all just get together and sort things out is something you hear quite often. You know, these bastards just get together and sort the whole thing. Well, they wouldn't say bastards on the BBC News Bulletin, but you know what I mean. Um, and that's a very common phrase. Why don't they all get together and sort things out? But if you think about it, if they were to all get together to sort things out, what would be the first thing to go? And the answer is trust, because they all, in inverted commas, disagree with each other about what needs to be done. So if they all got together and pretended to agree, they would be uh, breaking with their own sense of belief and conviction for some sort of expedient project, which they would then have to lie about in terms of their commitment to it. So when voters say, I don't trust these bastards, why don't they all just get together? Um, 
that would actually be a breakdown in trust in politics. And then sometimes you hear the exact opposite from voters. You know, the problem with these people is they're all the same. Well, if that's the problem, why do they then want them to get together to be the same? So in other words, uh, there is a confusion about what people really expect of politicians. And then you get from the political side, a kind of distortion through language, which appears to be an engagement with voters, but is actually a sort of artful deception, but widely admired. We're gonna come on to the populace later. I'm talking about mainstream politicians. The use of the term center ground is referred to with great reverence in uh, much of politics, but I think is a very imprecise term and in some ways a dishonest term. What is the center ground? You can't, you know, Tony Blair is, no, I'm on the center ground, right? You know. Well, what is the center ground? What does he mean by that? And sometimes in appearing to engage, you are actually establishing a greater distance with the voter through imprecision, actually. Uh, other terms that become, <clears throat> become very popular in mainstream politics, like modernization. Uh, what does that mean, modernization? And so just the dynamic of cliche terms that are very ubiquitous in politics actually are part of the problem when forming a relationship of trust between elected politicians and voters. And then there is the nature of politics itself. There are many interviewers, I hear them all the time, people like Adam Bolton, who used to present uh, Sky News, saying the problem with these politicians is they don't answer the question. How can you trust these people when they don't answer the question? And the answer as to why they don't answer the question candidly is because producers and presenters have spent two hours framing a question, which if they did answer candidly, the next statement from them would be, I therefore resign, because the question has been constructed to be a trap. And therefore to avoid the trap, the politician evades, equivocates, and to use a favorite word banded around in America and Britain all the time now, uh, lies, um, rather than answer the question directly. Now, is that an appalling example of building or of breaking down any hope of a bond of trust between voter and audience? No, it's what anyone has to do in any walk of life where you are working with others towards some complicated common goal. The university leadership here uh, cannot always be candid with the entire university as they move towards some, say, contentious objective. And that really is the same in politics. And yet this has been the source of a great sense of a breakdown in trust between voters and politicians. It is a complex vocation politics. It's better than the alternative, which is to resolve disputes by war. That's the two we've got. But politics in its attempt to resolve disputes involves evasion, equivocation, ambiguity, and sometimes people pretending to believe things that they don't. It's just the reality. But if that's not accepted as the reality, the breakdown in trust becomes really, really dangerous. And that's what has happened to some extent. One other thing about trust in this context is this. Let me present you with a couple of examples where trust becomes quite interesting. Keir Starmer, now 20 points ahead in the polls, uh, he is described all the time as boring, um, but, you know, also a person of integrity, the former director of public prosecutions. Um, and, and yet here's something. When he stood for the leadership just two and a half years ago um, uh, and won, he made 10 
pledges, most of which he's reneged on. Was he lying then? Is he lying now? Or was he being political and saying things to win in his party and saying different things to win in the country? I pose the questions to highlight the complexity of trust and politics in any era, let alone the global one. Let me be counterintuitive again and say, do you remember Liz Truss? She was prime minister um, <laughs> for four weeks. Uh, you might have forgotten. Um, but arguably what she did, if you regard trust as the criteria, uh, was trustworthy. She told uh, a leadership contest, which went on for about 25 years, um, that she was going to break with Treasury orthodoxy, that it had been a mess, the consensus over economic policy, that she believed growth was the issue, and she was going to cut taxes. And she did it. Now, the end result was total chaos and her own departure. But you could argue that here was an example of trust and trust, a phrase that has never been uh, uttered before but actually shows again, I think, the complexity of trust and politics. So I'm going to reflect on the many consequences of this awkward dance between voters and politicians and the issue of trust and root it, as I said at the beginning, in the 2008 post-financial crash era. Um, but again, I make this qualification. It's not as if it's new. Sometimes with the rise of Trump, the rise of the right in extraordinary places like Sweden um, and the rise of the AFD in Germany, you know, far right party in uh, Germany with Brexit here and so on and the rise of Johnson, that it is a new phenomenon, this issue where leaders are viewed with great skepticism as trust is broken down in this fractured globalized era. It's always been around. To take pre-2008, you know, a few examples. I mean, the United States, they might be coping with Trump, but they had Watergate and the removal of a president um, who was involved in, they always say he was involved in the cover-up and it's become a cliche that it's the cover-up and not the crime, but it was a pretty big crime to bug your opponents. Um, Blair and Iraq, that was pre the financial crash. Um, John Major, the issue that was at the top of voters' concerns about the major government was sleaze. In other words, they didn't trust him. And when you look back at that rosy, innocent era, uh, that government was major, Heseltine, Ken Clark, Douglas Hurd all personifications of integrity compared with now, they felt because voters thought they were sleazy. They didn't trust them. And so it has been a constant uh, long before that, to quote Brown again, the first huge crisis of the globalized era. But there is no doubt that what happened in 2000 and eight represented a major severance of trust with the mainstream. Because before the financial crash, there were a kind of set of assumptions and orthodoxies shared by enough voters for mainstream parties on the whole to be fairly confident that they would be re-elected on that so-called ill-defined center ground. To give one obvious example, bankers were revered before 2008. They were the equivalent of, um, I don't know, church vicars in the 1950s or whatever. Um, and there's a very interesting example of this. When the new Labour government and Gordon Brown as Chancellor decided they would have to put up taxes to pay for the NHS, they were in a terrible state about it. They, they thought Britain couldn't cope with this. The press would destroy them. So Brown said, I know what we'll do. In order to protect us from this tax rise, I'm going to appoint a banker 
to review what is needed to pay for the NHS. And he appointed the then head of the NatWest Bank, Derek Wanless, to do a review and come up with the answer Gordon Brown wanted, that a tax rise was needed. And his statement, Brown's statement, to announce the tax rise is really revealing. He doesn't say, I think it's necessary. He says, Wanless thinks it's necessary. Wanless, Wanless. And because bankers were so revered, it was seen as this great protective shield. Voters trusted bankers. Politicians wanted to be photographed with bankers. And in 2008, the whole thing crashed. And all the assumptions held by these mainstream politicians and the voters that elected them were blown away. And voters, or some of them, began to wonder about the mainstream and the virtues of elected politicians. And ever since, there have been convulsions wherever you look. Um, in America, you can, I think, trace the rise of Trump to the crash of 2008. You can trace the rise of Brexit to that. And you can trace the rise of extraordinary things like the rise of Scottish, the Scottish National Party to the convulsions around that period. And what has happened, therefore, since then is really quite dangerous because there has been a rise of political figures who basically say this, that those who you elect are either useless or corrupt. And what we need is a whole load of new people, me, to come in. And this has led to a really strange phenomenon, dangerous phenomenon, which is underexplored, which is this, that to be wholly inexperienced in politics is a qualification for power. So Trump's pitch uh, in his first bid to be American president, he can't make it this time, uh, was that he had nothing to do with Washington. Um, he didn't know Washington, didn't, uh, never been to the White House. Um, I don't know anything about politics or economics. Vote for me to be your president. Now, just think about that for a second. In any other walk of life, such a pitch would not get you very far. If, for example, uh, there was a Shakespearean production being put on at Newcastle University uh, of great significance for the university, and someone walked off the street and said, Look, it's all right, I'll play Hamlet. And the director said, well, have you, what else have you done? Nothing. I said, oh, brilliant, you're Hamlet. That is what um, the pitch of some of these post-crash populists made. And in a way, it became more dangerous than that in uh, Britain with uh, the row over Brexit. Because when Boris Johnson was trying to force through his Brexit in that hung parliament when he was first prime minister in December, uh, November, December 2019, before the election, he was quite explicit about the juxtaposition. It was parliament versus the people. Now that um, is, when you think about it, and very few politics is so fast moving, these statements have not been fully explored. On one level, it is a ridiculous contortion because it's the people who elect the MPs to parliament. Um, but it's also dangerous because if you decide that those you elect immediately in some weird journey to this point place in Westminster or Washington or wherever, um, you become against the people who put you there. And in that space, all kinds of strange figures can surface. Look at Farage, Nigel Farage, who has never actually been in the House of Commons and turns that to an advantage. Um, when he was at the peak of his powers, he used to chair a phone-in on LBC. And I used to listen, and it was very revealing. 
people used to phone him up and say things like this. This was a typical exchange. I'm, this is almost verbatim. Uh, Hello, Nigel. It's Trevor here from East London. Hello, Trevor. What's your point? Nigel, I just want to say this country's in deep, deep trouble. There's only one person who could save us. Oh, who's that, Trevor? You, Nigel. Oh, right. Well, I, I see I see your point. I, yeah. it, that was about the hardest interrogation of Nigel Farage's position. But because he was for the people against Parliament, it had a certain potency. And in a way, the Trump pitch now, which seems objectively from a kind of distance absurd, um, that the elite stopped him from winning the last presidential election, which of course he won, is in that same area. The people against the elected elite of Washington, you know, Biden and all the others, um, it, it, it has a kind of potency. To those who have decided, whoever we elect becomes in some weird way contaminated um, by democracy, in effect. And those you trust are people who have nothing to do with any of that. Now, one of Boris Johnson's uh, smart tricks was um, he was absolutely of that kind of elite. Uh, Eton, Oxford, um, that, uh, editing The Spectator, the House of Commons. Um, but somehow or other, because of the Brexit referendum, he was linked with the people against the elite. That referendum was a massive moment in the history of trust and politics. Because if you appear to challenge the referendum in any way, you were inevitably against the people. And that, by the way, was Johnson's bond of trust. It's a complete myth that voters tolerated his mendacity, his infidelities. It wasn't about that. The bond was that he was delivering what they voted for, therefore he is worthy of trust. Even if he lied in the referendum about what Brexit would deliver, there was this bond because he was going to deliver it. And um, it is a really dangerous uh, combination. Uh, people versus the elected. And as I say, let's through all kinds of odd characters. But let's for a moment look at these odd characters. Because one of the interesting things about the populace who surfaced in this era of, I would only put it this way, deeper mistrust with politicians, um, is that they are all afraid to face the consequences of their own actions. There is a really interesting pattern. They appear intimidating and mighty in the hold they have over a certain section of the electorate. But when they get close to prevailing, they run a mile. And so, for example, Farage, the day after his triumphant win in the Brexit referendum, announced his resignation as, as leader of UKIP. Not for him, the hard grind of negotiating Brexit, of defining what it means, back to the LBC studio and callers telling him how wonderful he is. It's very interesting if you look at the Brexit secretaries of state, surely the ultimate dream. Uh, they've all resigned, one after another. And the most recent, the unelected Lord Frosty Frost, who was Brexit secretary, Johnson put him there, Frosty, Frosty, all, all yours, Frosty. Um, and Frosty took it as all his, and the moment he got involved in negotiations over the unsolvable Northern Ireland Protocol, he resigned. David Davis resigned. He was the first Brexit secretary. Dominic Raab resigned. And if it's very interesting. The leader of the AFD in Germany had a triumphant, this was a populist party of the right in Germany, had a great victory four years ago in the parliamentary elections and got seats for the first time 
in the German parliament, she resigned the next day, rather than continue facing the hard grind of legislation and policy making, which is part of politics. So although this era of recent years has produced figures who are quite dangerous in the way they project what democracy is all about, uh, they are also uh, flaky. Um, to, to balance it, I would say the same, for example, applies in a very, he was a very different character, but if you look at the rise of Jeremy Corbyn, another symptom of this era of volcanic, unpredictable change. I mean, his is the most remarkable story, really, in politics. Uh, this figure who had been a backbench MP from 1983, took no part in any front bench role in the new Labour era and all the rest of it, suddenly becomes leader of the opposition on a landslide victory in uh, 2015. And I, I've, I've said in a book I've written about him and others, um, it really is the equivalent of watching someone playing tennis in a tennis court in a park and saying, oh, that was interesting. We'll put you on the center court at Wimbledon for the final tomorrow. Because you know, you, you, to be a leader, you have to have skills and experience in so many different ways. But such was the hunger for change in the Labour Party then, which was in itself a product of mistrust after Iraq and what was seen as the uh, betrayals of new Labour, uh, that they chose someone who, frankly, I think now is much more at ease uh, back uh, on his allotment in uh, near Islington, uh, where he is apparently again producing the most fantastic courgettes. Um, and actually, it was a very revealing moment in the 2017 general election, uh, the one that Theresa May called. And it's certainly Theresa May, whatever you think of her, she's a curious figure in many ways, but actually quite an honourable person in this era of mistrust. Uh, but her, it was a disaster of an election for her. And it was very interesting. She came on. Uh, that. Do, 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 have you ever seen the one show on BBC One? Some of you may have seen it. Um, she came on during the election campaign and uh, she was so nervous she brought Philip her husband on and they were asking her the easiest questions going and one of the questions was who puts the rubbish out at, you know in her house in number 10 and she looked as if she'd been asked to reveal the nuclear code she looked terrified she couldn't answer the question and um, the next day, Jeremy Corbyn uh, was the guest in you know, the balance. Um, and it was the day the Daily Mail had published eight pages of uh, Corbyn, uh, the terrorist friend, Corbyn, the IRA supporter, all the rest of it. And on he came, Jeremy Corbyn. And everyone watching, we got, uh, we're here, this combination of Lenin, Stalin, Jerry Adams. Um, and he came on and he said to the presenter, oh, I've got two jars of my homemade rhubarb jam from my allotment. And the was presenter, oh, thank you very much. The audience went wild. Um, the power of the allotment and old fashioned communication. Which brings me on to another element of all of this. And it's a complicated one again. Obviously, I mentioned there an orthodox, old-fashioned television program, The One Show, conventional chat show interview. But we all live now in the era of social media. And this, I think, has had an astonishing effect on politics and trust. But again, I think ambiguous. People often quote the Trump tweets as being a major ingredient in his successful presidential campaign, although remember he didn't get as many votes as Hillary Clinton, but he did win that one. Um, and he tweeted all the time. Uh, and the tweets were comically preposterous and yet apparently quite effective. Social media inevitably heightens a sense of mistrust because it is so feverish. It's very hard for any politician to appear, to quote Theresa May in the 2017 election, strong and stable. Do you remember that was her pitch in Twitter? I'm strong and stable. 
because everything, you know, you, you go on Twitter and you say, oh, there's someone who looks strong and stable. And then suddenly you read someone say, that person is certifiably insane and is going to destroy everything. Oh, Jesus, can't be strong and stable. Everything. And of course, the subjects of the criticism read them and get more and more worked <clears throat> up. But I kind of wonder about this. There's no doubt at all social media has heightened a sense of frenzy in uh, elected politics. But that frenzy, frankly, has always been there. It just means it's more constant, that rhythm of hysteria. Um, when I look back at some of the British leaders I've studied in the past, people, you, you, you're all far too young to remember him, but there the was a Labour Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, who, um, you know, Martin, we, Martin and I were talking about that era, you know, he was uh, deeply paranoid about other colleagues, spies, probably justifiably eavesdropping on what he was up to. Um, and that was in the era of about six newspapers, three channels. So I wonder whether the impact of social media has been somewhat exaggerated. But what is unquestionably the case, and this applies across Europe, America, and Britain, is the failure of those mainstream parties that I began my talk referring to in adapting to these dramatically changed circumstances. So we do live in this globalized economy that has advantages and terrible uh, challenges as well. That brilliant phrase coined by, I think it was Dominic Cummings in the Brexit campaign, uh, the left behind. Actually, it's got nothing to do with the European Union, but it has a hell of a lot to do with globalization and this sense of hopelessness and helplessness in the face of impossible torrents. And that was the way Tony Blair framed it originally. There was a famous party conference speech he made where he said, globalization is happening as night follows day, as winter follows autumn, and you just better adapt. And that was kind of it, a sense of terrible, hopeless inevitability, which these non-politicians challenged with an assertive flourish that was understandably appealing. We'll build a wall between Mexico and the United States. We'll protect borders, and yet we will still be able to trade openly, all the kind of things that arose. And mainstream parties have been very slow to adapt. And you can see them trying to do so, um, and yet failing. So in America, the Republicans are still split between the sort of Trumpian make America great again, nationalism, the kind of Reaganite right, the kind of the Republicans have a kind of Thatcherite balance your books right, uh, right. None of them really have worked out what instruments of intervention are available to say, well, yeah, it, it, it does happen like night follows day, but we can help you. And what's been interesting about the pandemic uh, and some of the things that have happened since the pandemic is you can see mainstream politicians finally having to use levers that they've been reluctant to pull in the past. Uh, Rishi Sunak, a self-declared fiscal conservative spending a fortune on furlough. Uh, in other words, they didn't just say and say, look, the pandemic is happening like night follows day, get on with it. They intervene like nothing else. Boris Johnson, um, when he, in his own confused way, was trying to move his party on from a kind of rep kind of homage, never-ending homage to Thatcherism, which was absolutely a product of the late 70s and early 80s. He used to go around sometimes say, call me a Roosevelt-ian. <laughs> Um, now, what he was doing is saying the, there is a virtue sometimes in public spending. Um, now, admittedly, with him, it was never followed through properly and all the rest of it, but it was there. And same with Theresa May, who said, um, it's time for us to talk about the good that government can do. I think this was all in response to the challenge of globalization that had been leapt on by these uh, populist 
uh, figures. And, and so you can see the kind of struggle, you can see it now with Sunak. It's so interesting that um, he wants to balance the books, but he can't really find ways of cutting public spending in this kind of desperately dark era. Um, that, that, that party is kind of moving away from globalization being something that is just going to happen without anything else, but they're not there yet. And so you can see kind of debates. Uh, Biden was actually quite brave in America in pledging to spend a ton of money on what I think he called his Green Deal or Green uh, Revolution, but it is using levers in ways that voters can relate to. And you can see the kind of mainstream parties trying to catch up. And therefore, a new pattern is developing of quite sort of dull, expedient people. I'm not saying this is a good or a bad thing, you know, winning in America, Germany, although Merkel wasn't a bundle of laughs, actually, when I think about it. Um, and she, by the way, highlighted one of the great dilemmas. And I'll end on that. And then we can please ask me anything about anything um, uh, on, on trust in the era of globalization. When loads of refugees famously fled Syria, uh, Merkel was up for taking many in, and she assumed uh, that other EU members would be equally up for it and it would be coordinated, um, and that these refugees would not just be in Germany, but they would be all over the place. And to her bewilderment, and it caused a huge crisis for her, uh, they weren't. Because in Austria, the government there said, bloody hell, if we take these refugees, uh, the right that are already breathing down our necks are going to get in. And by the way, they did uh, in a presidential election in Austria around this time. Sweden, then still a left of centre coalition, we're not going to take them or hell will break loose. Britain, Cameron and George Osborne didn't want to go near it. And there you have the ultimate dilemma in the era of globalization, where uh, politicians do two things. They first of all say with great solemnity how terrible it is what's happening in Syria, Ukraine. Uh, we will, of course, do all we can to help those fleeing these terrible conditions. Afghanistan's another one. And then the moment the issue of all these people coming here and the borders not being protected goes to the top of the agenda, they have to run a mile. And there is again a breakdown of trust on both sides. Uh, those who think it's a good thing in this era of endless global movement of people, uh, that countries take them, they feel betrayed because in the end, the countries don't. And those who think the borders should be shut as the main priority of any government feels let down because, you know, God, you know, there were figures, uh, quite ironic figures published, I think, yesterday that more people have come in post-Brexit than before here, where the borders was meant to be an element of taking back control. And so you can see how this issue of trust becomes so feverish and highly charge. But I'll end on this. If voters, all of us lot, especially the media that screams noisily on all issues, do not acknowledge the complex dilemmas facing uh, leaders, we will get into much, much deeper difficulty. Um, you know, Starmer now, he believes privately in the advantages of going into Europe? Is he lying when he pretends not to anymore? Or is he doing what he has to do in order to regain so-called red wall voters? Um, is Sunak, what's he going to do to win the next election? He wants to see the economy growing. One way you could see the economy growing is to have a closer relationship with the single market, as Jeremy Hunt briefed the Sunday Times uh, a couple of Sundays ago. But then your party implodes. And um, if your party implodes and threatens to overturn you and bring back Boris Johnson, who apparently is going around saying, I, I, I'm the only former and future prime minister. Um, what do you do? 
And in navigating these dilemmas, you are inevitably going to alienate many people and reinforce a breakdown of trust. But actually, what you're trying to do is resolve dilemmas that are almost impossible to resolve. I remember, I'll end with this, then we can have a conversation. Seen Blair very early. I used to invite the, uh, us lot, columnists and people, in all the time when he was prime minister. And I remember seeing him. He was about 40 points ahead in the polls uh, early on after that 97 election, where he had this never ending honeymoon, which incidentally broke over the issue of trust and whether he lied about Iraq and all the rest of it. Um, Anyway, he's miles ahead in the polls. And uh, he, I, he, I went into the, the office where he worked in number 10. So I uh, sit down, yeah, come in, do come in. And I said, oh, God, you look quite tired. He said, yeah, his job's pretty knackering, actually. And he said, it's the decisions. He said, every decision, you know, you've got to make a lot of decisions. And the question really is, do you slash your wrist or cut your throat? And that's what you've got to decide to do. And those are often the dilemmas faced by politicians. And in a way... I think we certainly in the media and elsewhere have a responsibility to explore the dilemmas as well as screaming betrayal and lies and all the stuff which inevitably accompany some of these people as they nav navigate the world in the globalized era. Thank you very much for listening. Let's have a wider conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. We've got plenty of time for comments and questions. If you catch my eye, I'll ask one of our microphones to come and reach you. Uh, one behind, uh, two back there. If you'd wait for the microphone to get to you so that um, everyone can hear your question and sort of speak closely into it. Um, if I could just break the, break the ice by asking, Steve, um, one of the corollaries in a way of, of trust is the, is the notion of a person taking responsibility for forfeiting the trust um, and resigning, perhaps honourably, over over a malfeasance. Uh, is it anecdotally the case that it's less common now than it used to be, or was it ever thus? Uh, no, it was not ever thus. It is less common now. And it is, it is really bad, actually. I mean, here, I think um, those who are angry with politicians have justification. The last really principled resignation I can remember is Robin Cook on the eve of the Iraq war, who then made a brilliant speech in the House of Commons which proved to be quite prophetic. And in retrospect, it is staggering that only one cabinet member resigned over such, such a huge moment. Um, but what I found really very difficult to take in recent times uh, is you know, all those cabinet ministers, one after another, coming up to defend Boris Johnson over party gate and, and then what he knew about what was that Dickensian character called? Mr. Pincher. Um, oh, yes, yes. You know, um, Pincher by name. at uh, uh, the cult, what he got up to at the Colton Club. And his cabinet ministers uh, knew uh, they weren't, you know, uh, telling, to put it as most polite, the full story. And, um, and yet on they went. And there's a huge thing now, you know, that Boris Johnson supporters make about the resignation of... Uh, Rishi Sunak, when he finally resigned. But to be honest, the issue was, uh, did he wait too long, uh, really, uh, to resign? Uh, because for months and months and months, they've had to put up with uh, pretty outrageous, uh, contradictory statements from number 10, which they then all had to go on and defend. So the principled resignation is a very powerful thing for a politician to do. However, it does mean that they probably won't be in government again, ever. You know, uh, Robin Cook was never in mm -hmm. government again. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very big thing to do. But it used to go on more. Do you remember uh, Carrington, who was resigned yes. over the Falklands, even though it was absolutely nothing to do with him? Uh, the Argentina invaded the Falklands. It was to, actually Thatcher was more culpable uh, because they were cutting back on uh, the forces protecting the Falkland Islands. But he resigned. Even better, uh, Willie Whitelaw and Michael Fagan, as seen in The <laughs> Crown, uh, yeah. the intruder in the Queen's bedroom, the Home Secretary offered to resign, even though he was hardly responsible for Michael Fagan jumping over the wall yeah. of Buckingham Palace. Yeah, yeah, 
There is an interesting debate, it's, it's connected with trust, about who is responsible for what. And it, it's particularly complicated if you're Home Secretary, you know, should you resign if a prisoner escapes? Mm. And my answer would be no, you can't be running a prison. But who is responsible for what is a big, and, and it, the answer in Britain is always too complicated. You know, you look at lines of responsibility from white all out, say, in terms of the National Health Service or whatever, and it is really complicated. Uh, lots of wriggle room, as it were. Uh, yeah. Question over here, please. Yes, well, thank you very much, Steve. For, for, thank you. So I'm just going to get talk. carry on. Um, well, first, I really appreciate you mentioning the rise of the right wing and populism coming from Italy, where, as you know, yes. it's been happening since 1994, and yeah. populist politicians do do everything except uh, resign when they get to actually get into power. I suppose we can have a better talk about it later. Um, my question is about um, about trust. So. When we talk about trust, there are two things that we can mean. Um, it can be that either somebody tells me something I don't know, and I trust that this is true. Okay, is it going to rain tonight? I don't know, but it will trust. I will trust you yeah. if you tell me it's going to rain. Yeah. The other type of trust is if somebody tells me that they will do something, and I trust that they will do it. Okay, you know, um, am I going to do the dishes tomorrow? Uh, I trust you, you will do it. So would you say that the problem with trust in politics nowadays is a problem of informational trust or is it a problem of effective trust or both or in what proportion? Does it make any sense? Yeah, well, uh, uh, there's, there's lots there. I, I, as you mentioned, Italy, before I come on to the question of uh, trust, um, uh, you remind me of another uh, kind of factor in uh, politics now, which is um, the rise of the entertainer as a politician. I think in Italy, it was the five star movement, wasn't it? Where it's one of its leaders uh, had been a stand up comedian or something, is that right? Yes, and before that, obviously, uh, That's Mr. Right. Berlusconi in Of course, you had yes. Berlusconi. Who, um, uh, and Trump, part of his popularity was appearing on uh, The Apprentice in America and Boris Johnson on Have I Got News For You. And here is a false but powerful way in which some figures uh, form a bond of trust uh, with voters via being on television as characters. Um, and that, I think, is really dangerous, I know, has been a factor in Italian uh, politics. In terms of trust, are you saying when someone predicts uh, the weather tonight, um, that's bound to be unreliable because no one knows for sure? Whereas if someone says, I'm doing the washing up tomorrow, that is a pledge that can be kept to if they want to. So one is out of their control, but they're still making it, or, or what? Well, I suppose, well, when I talk about informational trust, what I mean is I trust that somebody knows better. So if I go to the doctor and the doctor tells me you should really yeah. take this pill, I trust that what the doctor says is true. I acknowledge that I don't know, but I trust that the doctor knows better. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in that case, he's giving, so my doctor is giving me an information yeah. that I trust. They aren't necessarily doing anything about it, but they are telling me something that I trust is true. Yeah. Does that, does that help? Yeah, well, with voters and uh politics it's very interesting because I think the default position I don't know if it's the default position here um, is uh, on the whole not to trust uh, elected politicians and an elected government as I say to the point where it becomes quite dangerous if you say it's pe the people versus elected politicians but what's been very interesting is in a crisis they turn to them so to go back to the 2008 financial uh, crash, I remember Ed Miliband, who was then in the cabinet, uh, saying to me uh, at the start of it, he was being driven into work listening to the day programme. He heard an interview with somebody pleading uh, to um, for the government to intervene. 
and he thought, God, which which left wing trade unionist is this? And it was the head of which was that first bank that went bust in um, Britain, um, um, Scotland, uh, uh, not the Royal Bank, the, the American Bank, Bank. Lehman Brothers, Lehman Brothers. Brothers. It was the head of Lehman Brothers pleading for elected politicians to intervene. And so, and with the pandemic, I found it really interesting um, that every day people watch those press conferences. Um, uh, and, you know, even when Johnson's message was somewhat confused, you know, and mocked, you know, stay in, go out, go to work, don't go to work. Um, people, people listened because they needed to trust an agency in this out of control, out of their control situation. So I think it's it, uh, people choose to trust them in a crisis because they have nowhere else really to turn. But I think the default position, sometimes healthy, sometimes dangerous, is uh, a kind of intense mistrust. Italy is rather the exception to this point, but the evidence this year electorally in France or Brazil or the US has perhaps been, is there a pushback do you think from these people or are we being optimistic in thinking that the moment's passed? Well, I don't think there's ever been a clear pattern. I think all, so for example, as I said in the talk, Hillary Clinton did get more votes than, than, than uh, Trump. And in the midterm, the Democrats, uh, it, it was regarded in the end as a triumph for Biden uh, rather than for Trump, but yet they still did pretty well. Mm. Um, they're still a force to be reckoned with. So I don't think there's ever really been a clear pattern. As I say, you can uh, point to uh, Germany, Australia, who've gone for rather kind of dull technocratic uh, people who incidentally are struggling mm. in different ways to these uh, populists when they do uh, try and face the consequences of their, their words. Um, but um, you know, Sweden has had a big swing to the right very recently. I don't think there's ever been clear patterns, but I think uh, since 2008, there has been a kind of deeper mistrust, uh, uh, a bewilderment that the so-called mainstream are still trying to come to terms with. And in that space, populists have surfaced. Mm. I mean, it, optimistic, certainly this morning, news of Farage revi a Farage's revival in British politics. Yeah, well, he can't really keep away from the political stage. You know, that's the bit he loves. Um, so I don't think he really wants to be in government. I don't think Jeremy Corbyn really wanted to be in government. Um, and yeah, I, it will scare the Tories. I mean, the reason Cameron held the referendum of which the consequences are still being played out in so many different ways now, um, was the fear of Tory MPs defecting to Farage's then UKIP party. And the reason Johnson went for such a hard Brexit with a frosty, uh, threaten no deal, threaten no deal, um, he was scared of Farage's Brexit party. And now he's uh, saying he's going to lead this reform uh, party, and that will scare Sunak. Mm -hmm. So that means Sunak is, see, it's very interesting in uh, leadership in any field. Uh, you can look at a leader and say, oh, well, he's got some leaderly skills. And Sunak has got some. He's not the full work, but he's got some leaderly skills, certainly compared to Truss and Johnson. But he is trapped on that political stage. And one of the constraints is the fear of Farage. Mm -hmm. So even though I'm sure he knows that one route to gro growth is some closer relationship with the not necessarily joining the single market, he can't do it. There's no way he can do it. He'd prefer to sacrifice the growth than risk a Tory mm. civil war over it. Um, so leaders often are trapped and have very little space for manoeuvre. And that's different to them being untrustworthy. Mm. And yet the two are often conflated. I think Iraq's very interesting. Was Blair trapped by his fear of breaking with America? Or did he become this sort of evangelical madman willing to lie left, right and centre to go to war? And that's two very different sort of... What's your hunch? What's your feeling? I, I, I think he became trapped and therefore had to lie. But the trap, there was no escape from that trap. 
once you decide um, as a Labour figure, uh, you have to be seen to be close to America, and that America is going to war, and you want to keep in with them. Now, a big figure would challenge it. Wilson challenged Vietnam in 1968, but uh, he became trapped. And once you're on the route, incarcerated, you move towards your doom, fairly helpless. It does make one think of the element of contingency and chance in politics. A, a few dimpled chads in the Florida count and the Iraq war three years later. It wouldn't have happened. It yeah. wouldn't have happened. Tony Blair used to go around saying, look, it's worse than you think. I believe in all this stuff. But he, he, he wouldn't have gone to war in Iraq if Bush hadn't wanted to. Yes. So it was all about the relationship with America. Uh, a question at the back there, please. Uh, any on the on the right, as it were? And yes, two over here, please. Uh, just one at the front there, and then behind. Either one doesn't matter. Yeah, get both. Thank you. Yes, please, sir. It occurs to me that perhaps the issue is not anything to do with trust. It's about loyalty. So it's interesting about party politics. Yeah. The electorate are loyal to a party anymore. But the worst thing for me is that politicians ditch each other right, left and centre. There's no loyalty or cohesion within any party. So therefore, we can't trust them. If they're not loyal to each other, I don't trust them. Ah, uh, yeah, we see this is it's a brilliant question, but it, it does raise, again, what you mean by trust. So um, Johnson's cabinet were very loyal to him. They were going on the Today programme and saying, no, my understanding is there were no parties in number 10. Now, they were lying. Uh, they were not being trustworthy to the listeners, but they were being very loyal. However, I take your wider point. I mean, we've had three prime ministers since July. It's bonkers. And uh, equally, uh, wild swings in opinion polls, really, for a long, long time. And that's because the old loyalties have gone. And within, I mean, it's really interesting now. Uh, watching, for me, the Conservative Parliamentary Party, because um, not so long ago, it was a cliche about the Conservative Party that loyalty was their secret weapon. Uh, that They were so loyal to leaders, the Labour Party would be fighting each other. But um, now uh, the Conservative Parliamentary Party are very hard to control because they don't feel loyalty to a leader. They feel, and again, this is where trust is complicated, they feel loyalty to their convictions. And so you have someone like, do, it, do you know Steve Baker, the, you know, this guy who leads the uh, Tory Brexiteers in, in what's called the ERG group? You're a very charming figure, you know, he's a devout Christian. And I think he must go home and pray, dear God, please forgive me because I'm about to destroy another Conservative leader. Uh, because he comes into Westminster and conspires against one leader after another. Jacob Rees-Mogg, if he was sitting here, you would think, well, he's a very polite person. Um, and yet he politely knifes leaders, except for Boris Johnson, who he adores. I always remember with Rhys Mark, um, so, so it's this kind of thing of what is, uh, when Theresa May came back with one of her endless Brexit deals, he stood up in the House of Commons and said, could, could, could I just say I greatly admire the right honourable lady for her arduous work, which she does with great integrity, but could I also say that her deal would sink Britain and is the worst thing a British Prime Minister has done since 1945. And so sort of amidst the politeness, the knives go in. So there is no um, great loyalty in the way there used to be. But the issue of trust is more complicated. So for example, the Labour shadow cabinet are very disciplined at the moment, um, but they're not all speaking the truth in public. Uh, because discipline requires you stick to a line whether you like it or not. So trust is a very complicated issue. Uh, two questions over here. First in the front, please. Yes. I was interested in the idea of trust in terms of whether you uh, trust them in, to actually deliver. In that, yeah. Otherwise you think they're incompetent, basically. And yeah. Whether something like PR would help uh, improve the gene pool of uh, the people who are in charge at all. Yeah, well, that's it's it's around a lot again at the moment. Voting reform, I think, um, what would improve the gene pool, and it's deeply unfashionable, is that uh, the way parties select candidates needs to be changed, um, because at the moment local parties have nearly 
uh, all the power in selecting candidates. And many of you will, uh, I'm sure, agree with this. It's, it's the fashion of our times. Um, but what happens, and you can see it now, the Labour Party are busy selecting candidates for the next election. They tend to select for totally legitimate reasons. Local person who served the council for 20, 30 years, and they think, yeah, well, that, they deserve it. They're one of us, and we'll send them to Parliament. They don't ask, will this person be a good cabinet minister? Will this person be a good advocate? Will this person have ideas that can be translated into policy? And um, Martin and I were talking about some of the big figures from the 70s and 80s earlier, and a lot of them wouldn't get selected now. Um, because they weren't of the locality. So I think that's more important than voting reform. Voting reform would please a lot of people because they would suddenly feel their vote matters. But then they will look at the coalition that's formed, and some people will think, well, I didn't vote for any of this. you know. Um, and so I think that is a more complicated one. But it's definitely around. Um, I suspect it's not going to happen in the near future unless at the next election there's a hung parliament and then uh, Starmer will do anything to get into number 10. And I think he would say to the Lib Dems, let's go for it. Uh, but I think if Labour win a majority, it won't happen. You mentioned that the 24 months or so it appeared, gestation period for the Conservative leadership of Liz Truss. What, what lessons do you draw from that exercise in democracy? Well, you see, as I said in there, you know, she was completely honest. She didn't hide it. She told them what they were going, uh, what she was planning to do. Sunak warned uh, what would happen, and they all voted for her. This very small um, membership. I was really struck. I mean, I knew it was a small membership, um, but uh, when the results came in, if you remember, Sunak came second, but the margin wasn't as great as people thought, and uh, people say, "Oh, Sunak did really well." He got 60,000 votes. Well, that's the number who go to a football match, um, you know, and they were they were alone selecting the next uh, prime minister. And this, this is happening increasingly often because of your point about disloyalty. Um, uh, Sunak is, I think, the third prime minister since 2010 to be selected just by this small group. Mm. And it, 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 it is crazy that a small group can have such power. Now, it didn't matter as much uh, when, say, maybe one prime minister in a sort of period of party one party rule gets elected, because, you know, well, fair enough, once. So Brown got elected in 2007. And in, incidentally, another bizarre leadership contest where he stood against himself. No one else stood. Um, and that was weird. But, you know, it was that was the only time. So to have it three times since 2010, I think, raises questions about a lot of Tory MPs want to stop it for the next one. Um, Counterintuitively, fewer people is better. So Callaghan being elected in 76, May 1990, MPs only being rather than members. So restricting the electorate. There's a big move to make it MPs only. However, how do you tell your party members mm -hmm. you're not trusted to an elector leader? It's quite a hard message. You could show them Liz Truss, I suppose. Yeah, I yes. suppose Liz Truss, um, yeah. Anthony, please. Hi, thanks, Stu. Um, really interesting. I, I guess I was reflecting a little bit that, that the use or the appeal to it's time for a change is, is not new by any strange. It's been going on for, one might argue, centuries. Centuries, um, yeah. In, in yeah. that sense. Uh, and it's a, very, it's a very easy vehicle because it's a vehicle to which you can attach any fear or worry or concern. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so it's a vehicle that can carry a coalition with yeah. it. Um, I, I guess that, that brings me on to sort of the second sort of reflection on what you're saying, which is I, I sort of feel we're, we're sort of in an era of partisan politics in the sense of you have to buy the whole package. Um, if I want to support uh, uh, Sunak, I can't admit that Starmer has any valid opinion. Um, which, which in a way is actually undermining the the credit well the the opinion of the voter in a sense it's saying I'm not allowed to have what would appear to be contradictory beliefs and uh, an attitude which thereby says I'm not really entitled to have my own judgment and the likes so I have to sort of buy 
package A or package yeah. B. The reality we've got is that package A and package B are coalitions by their nature. That, yeah. That's what we see yeah. within the party. They're massive coalitions yeah. of opinion yeah. um, and the likes. Um, so I guess my question, and I'm, I, I come from a family of journalists, so I'm not taking issue with journalists and, and the media, but is, do you not think the media carry a huge responsibility for failing to take on those issues in an open, or, or perhaps not take them on, but bring them into everyday consciousness well, I, 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 I think the media are deeply culpable uh, for reasons I'll explain in a moment. But I'm afraid, Paul, you, you mentioned, you know, time for a change has been going on for centuries. Uh, politics in the end is a choice. I mean, you can't have Sunak and Starmer. Uh, or maybe you will. Who knows if there's a sort of a weird coalition. Um, but that only works in very unique situations. Churchill and Attlee during the Second World War. I mean, the the essence of democracy, and therefore, in theory, the bond of trust with voters, is you do get at least two different approaches to solving the economy, uh, say, or whatever. Um, uh, uh, in Scotland, you've got a, three or four different options. Um, uh, so in the end, you will have to choose. Now, where I think the media is deeply culpable is I said that you know politics is full of dilemmas it's not that straightforward and in a way the dilemmas are quite interesting they're like a thriller but you know if a leader goes this way then terrible things will happen they go that way it could be terrible maybe there's a way in which they emerge triumphant what's that and in exploring the dilemmas I think you can both interest the viewer reader listener and create a greater understanding of politics and I think the media has failed completely in that. And um, I think the BBC is going through a bad phase in terms of political coverage. I'll give you uh, one example. I think this Sunday morning programme, uh, Laura Coombsburg hosts, I don't know if any of you watch it, but it goes on for an hour and they quite often have eight guests. Now, how can you explore anything when each guest has about five minutes? I mean, us lot, we could all go on until midnight, couldn't we? And maybe we will. And, and but certainly you can't explore anything for five minutes. And and so uh, so the media is culpable in that way. The newspapers are, are um deeply partisan. And I mean, I, I I won't this is an impartial observation to say this, that the readers of the Daily Mail must be pretty confused because just a few weeks ago they were being told Boris Johnson was the greatest thing ever. Then they were told that Liz Truss was the greatest thing ever. Then they were told that she was a disaster and had to go. You know, it's all sort of strident. And, and, they, and, and during the leadership contest, they were saying Sunak was uh, just a complete catastrophe. And I, I think they, I assume they are now uh, batting for Sunak. So the media has got a lot to answer for. But in the end, elections are, I suppose, about choice, you know, however difficult they are. For many people and and time for a change you're right is a cheat of a slogan and it works very effectively so uh, a question here please uh, and then over in, in the black um yes thank you thank you i got the impression that for much of your talk you were talking about two different groups there was the potentially to be trusted the politicians and then there was the great boss, you know, the trusters. But I want to suggest that the trusters are just as volatile, just as wavering, just as hypocritical in their attitude as them. So this point that there are two groups of people oh, who are somehow I'm sorry if I gave... ethically different. Yeah. No, so this no. morning, for example, I stood waiting for a bus to travel south into Newcastle hardly any buses around, but thousands of cars pouring in, and the vast majority had one person in them. But the people driving those cars are not climate change deniers. Mm. They're all for it, but yes. they would say, well, that's the way we've got to get into Newcastle. Oh, brilliant point. I'm, I'm really pleased you made that point, because I was emphatically not trying to give the impression 
that there were the bad people, the politicians, and the good people, the voters, far from it. In fact, I think I try to make it uh, clear, uh, but maybe fail. Uh, the voters, in a lot of their assumptions are contradictory um, and, as you imply, hypocritical, and, and, and they are emphatically uh, part of the problem on many different levels. You give the probably the most vivid one of uh, climate change. Like you, I know loads of people who say in one minute, Ryan, green, green, green. And then the next conversation is where, where you're flying to next month to get a bit of sun you know so th that's one example but but the other one is this thing of in a way wanting conflicting things from politicians i think i gave the example of what one minute someone says you know why can't they all bloody work together and the next minute, oh, they're all the bloody same it's a disaster you know there is a heck of a lot of confusion which are, politicians aren't allowed to ever say anything mm. that implies voters are at fault mm. but we can and they're at fault so I agree with you and I'm sorry if that wasn't clear it's death this dance is an awkward dance uh and it's not about good and bad with one side being good and the other it's far more complicated than that yeah absolutely yes a uh, question here I believe uh yes please thank you <clears throat> good evening um I have been wondering for many, many years now, especially since 2014. Um, I come from the South, but I eventually campaigned for the Scottish referendum. And it's about trust, of course. And my question is going to be the following. How would you assess the SMP constant narrative of self-determination as a democratic universal right. Uh, can it be trusted after such a long time? And the most interesting question, which we are very concerned, especially coming from Catalonia, yeah. would it be pl plausible, reliable, to use a general election mm. as an independence referendum for the Scottish? Is that possible? Yeah. how when yeah well cancel all your engagements tonight because that question <laughs> raises many um different themes and first of all let's deal with the issue of uh referendums and trust and specifically the scottish one uh, and then come on to the how they're planning to use the general election so here you see it is it there is one argument, and it is a powerful argument, that the SNP have won election after election um, in Scotland. They should have the right to hold this referendum and determine uh, Scotland's future. However, when you look at the last referendum, uh, you have quotes from the leader of that referendum, Alex Salmond, that this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So what is true? that referendums are decisive and make or break, or are they something that can be revisited within a few years? And there is no clear answer to that. There are pros and cons on either side, but it's not wholly a breakdown of trust for the Westminster <coughs> government to say, no, we have one in 2014, and that determined uh, the outcome. Uh, and to revisit it so quickly makes referendums absurd because they're meant to decide things. On um, using the general election to um, uh, turn it into a referendum, it's, it, it is very interesting. First of all, it's quite risky for Nicola Sturgeon to do this. I mean, to get over 50% of the vote will not be easy. But I think even if she gets over 50%, um, it's quite hard to argue that a general election, which is about, I mean, you were saying, you know, the endless issues that Starmer and Sunak will be debating. And then in Scotland, you know, about the health service and education, um, to extract from it this one issue. Again, who, who do you trust? Do you agree, with, or basically, who do you agree with? Uh, Nicola Sturgeon or others who insist a general election is about much more. 
Um, but I would say this, that um, I think if she keeps on winning uh, or the SNP keep on winning uh, uh, the Scottish elections, there will have to come a point, and I think it will be quite soon uh, when they get a second referendum. Um, but I mean, that's just my reading of it. The, again, the, we're talking, I use this metaphor of the dance, you know, the dance between voters and politicians. And, um, this dance between her demanding a referendum, Westminster saying no, and then her um, playing, I know you're a supporter, but uh, playing the sort of martyred role of not being able to do something, which then increases support for her. There has to be a point where she gets the second reference if she hangs around long enough. So I think it will happen, but but I don't think the device of calling a general election a referendum would necessarily be that moment. Margaret Thatcher and Kevin Attlee didn't give up very many things, but they agreed that referendums were alien to our culture yeah. and traditions, and they've become very common of late. Uh, do, you, do you believe in their their utility? I think they're. A disaster to be honest because um partly to do with the british media i mean the british media is so frenzied it's not going to be that educational a referendum in anywhere in britain although the scottish one i think was better than the brexit referendum but they both suffered i think from the fact that there was a kind of status quo which looked quite you know unattractive um versus an ill-defined alternative so no one's quite sure yet what form independence will take. So I think if there is a second referendum, if there's any referendum again on anything, the alternative has to have been worked through in much more detail. So in other words, if there's a referendum in Scotland, which I think you want, um, it would have to be not uh, the status quo versus independence. It will have to be the status quo versus a very detailed, worked out independence. Um, what currency, borders, um, everything agreed and then put in detail to the electorate. This is a case for learning from lessons, isn't it? For your, yeah, your making yeah. And, then, and, and then in Ireland, they have kind of all sorts of citizens, juries and stuff looking at these issues before the vote. I mean, Cameron was so casual about the Brexit thing. Mm. Um, and so I think if, we if we're going to use more of them, we have to look at the lessons of the last mm. two. A question over here, please. Um, hi. So I think the discussion and the questions so far have been really great and mainly focused on the Western side of politics as well. I would just like to get this a bit out of context and go a bit to the extreme. What happens if, what, what do you think would happen if all of the referendums, the media and the elections as well is mainly just an impression over an actual um, thing which changes things, the government? A current case, for example, in Hungary, the government has been on for 12 years. Yeah. The media is mainly impersonating as well that it's great. And people do believe it. Where do you think this sort of, impression of trust will go in the future in our current yeah well i mean in the uk it's been 12 years as well one party um yeah well it's very interesting so so the media in hungary is it largely pro government yes yeah yes. yeah well that is i mean voters the power of the media i mean you will know from what's happened in <clears throat> hungary is cannot be underestimated because when you think about it none of us um follow politics unmediated you know we don't watch all the speeches we don't analyze the evolution of a policy from an announcement to whether it gets anywhere we do it all one way or another through the media now i think one of the advantages of social media is that you can see more of the kind of raw material but most of it's mediated so if voters in Hungary are being told left, right and centre what a brilliant job the government is doing, that will be the level of the engagement, really. You know, so, oh, yeah. I, I, and, um, you know, one of the many reasons why uh, Johnson had such a hold over a range of voters uh, was 
the newspapers they read told told them he was the greatest thing since Churchill. Um, and so it is it is it is a very powerful instrument to have for a governing party to have a supportive uh, press. But things things do change because of this time for a change thing. I mean, it looks who knows British politics is so unpredictable, but it looks if there could be a change of government at the next election. Um, but that will have been 14 years of one party here. So do, do you think the if, if the government would change in the future, would that be like, how would that play out as well? Would there be a positive change? Or would you think that change, what, what's the current status quo would make it a bit worse as well? Well, if there's a change of government yes. here or in Hungary? Uh, in, in the UK. In the UK. I Oh, God, I think, well, it, I'm not giving my views of where I stand in, in, in policy, but I'll say this, uh, although I, I can do, um, I'll tell you if you want, but, it's, but I think um, after four, uh, yeah, four election wins of one party uh, amidst incredible chaos, wherever you look, um, for that party to win a fifth term in such a context will in itself uh, trigger quite dangerous consequences, I think. Um, I won't go any more than that, but I mean, it, it would uh, yes. be quite something after a deep recession, um, the Liz Truss experiment, to put it at its most polite, uh, where 50 billion pounds was blown in one mini budget, to then get re-elected says quite a lot of, of quite worrying things, but, but I, I won't go any further into my own kind of views on we have a chance for that very shortly i can almost hear the wine being unscrewed as we yeah. as we talked opportunity is, is about to be forthcoming uh, one very very last question at the front please if you don't mind uh, yes and then i'll uh, i'll wrap up hi steve uh, hi. well thank you for a fascinating lecture and your brilliant impersonifications of boris johnson oh yeah um, <laughs> thank you very much so within the context of political entertainment and social media i was wondering whether um, trust is becoming obsolete and replaced by the ability to influence people. Yeah. It's not based on one's credentials yeah. or competence, but charisma and, I don't know, swagger or yeah. something like yeah. that. Because uh, if we think about influence being uh, a, a currency for political leaders, I think um, Liz Truss's uh, very short uh, term as a prime minister showed that she was an influence bankrupt. Um, and you also talked about those complex problems that polit politicians can't uh, sort out, those wicked problems, because they are so multifarious and uh, very often there's very little scope uh, for uh, an educational debate in the media. So isn't it about influence and who can influence people regardless of whether they trust they're being trusted yeah no i think it's a really great question and it it yeah and it's it's been very interesting watching for example uh johnson and uh uh i was going to say trust but i meant trump um very closely because um so now johnson has been deposed I heard an interview with the head of the Northern Group of Conservative MPs. So he represents all those in the Red Wall seats. And he was saying, he's a great fan of Boris Johnson. And he said um, he went to uh, his local pub um, to talk about Johnson's fall. Um, and he said, they all, well, they're not going to vote for us. They only loved him. And the interviewer to this guy is called Jake Berry. Said, "Why? Why did they love me?" So there's something they 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 related to him, and and he didn't say this. The, they related to him because they saw him on telly being funny, um, as I talked about trust and uh, Trump and the the Apprentice and uh, the Italian equivalent we've uh, explored. And funny enough, Zelensky was a, mm -hmm. a comedian, yes. wasn't he? Yeah. Um, and you're absolutely right. That is the bond that's been forged. And I remember uh, when Johnson was really still very popular as prime minister, he went up to Hartlepool for the Hartlepool by-election, uh, which the Tories won. 
uh, very unusual for a government to gain a seat uh, when they're in power. And it was fascinating watching him with the voters. The voters were looking at him adoringly. Very poor town, you know. Um, and, uh, and it was because they were watching a television celebrity, someone really famous. Mm. And so you're, I think you're absolutely right because um, this interviewer said to uh, this guy, Jake Berry, but don't some of them think he lied to them and had broke his own rules and had parties during the lockdown and things? They, they don't mind. They just, they just think he's great fun sort of thing. And so you're right. I think we are in an era where that can be a bond between a voter and a politician. Um, and it's, as you say, nothing to do with trust, almost the opposite. You know, they say what they want. People go, oh, yeah, good old Boris, you know, and good old Nigel Farage. And, and good. Old, and I think Donald Trump famously said, I could go in some parts mm -hmm. of America and shoot someone and they'd still love me, you know, and that, so that is a new phenomenal, I think. Yeah, and I think it, it's linked to what you said about uh, Keir Starmer being boring, because he doesn't go for the kill in any PMQs. I often get frustrated because he could really make a very strong point, but he doesn't do it. He's too diplomatic and too reserved. Yeah, it's quite hard to imagine him going on and cracking jokes, isn't it? Um, even though it's very interesting. I mean, I think, <clears throat> by the way, it's a, it, it, it's a really kind of sign of the media how kind of rude they can be because there was a phase a few months ago where every interview Keir Starmer did the interview would begin by saying uh so Keir Starmer are you boring as if he's going to say yeah I'm really boring I'm almost falling asleep being me because I'm so boring um and then one of the interviewers said well in what way aren't you boring which is very kind of aggressive mm. thing you know and he said that she said Kathy Newman on Chuffle she said uh name something to me, which shows you're not boring. And he said, um, oh, well, I had piano lessons with Fat Boy Slim, you know, the rock star. And they said, oh yeah, that's not boring. Now, actually he's not boring. He played, he, you know, in Britain, there's a big thing that prime ministers must love football. And some of them pretend to love football. David Cameron got the team wrong that he supported. Um, and I think Tony Blair made a mistake about his love for Newcastle. Didn't he saw he? Jackie Milburn playing. Saw yes. Jackie Milburn Apparently. when he was six months old or something. Um, Keir Sama loves football. He plays five or seven aside football. Um, and he is a, goes every week to so, our rival team. He's an Arsenal supporter. Yes, so all the kind of stuff where actually quite a lot of voters would relate to um he he you know so he learned music with a rock star he loves football but he's not an artist in politics now artistry is an absolute precondition of leadership now that doesn't necessarily mean you have to be a johnson or a trump but you do need to have to connect find ways of connecting and he he hasn't done that yet um, but maybe voters like, as say in Germany and Australia, you just go in the end for solidity. And who knows? We'll know in two years' time. One, one very last simple question for you. Um, we both believe very much in the importance of context. Context. And the danger of recency bias. Everything that's happening recently is worse than anything that's happened before. Um, do you think that, the, the, that you became political correspondent at the BBC in 1990, the year Margaret Thatcher fell? Um, do we have a uniquely, a historically poor generation of politicians, or is it more that circumstances have been such in the last few years that their weaknesses and their, their liabilities have been more apparent than would be the case in easier times? Yeah, no, I, I think we do have uh, quite uh, insubstantial political figures and quite insubstantial political journalists. I don't know why this has happened. Um, but there's very few. I, I know there's this, this guy in the uh, shadow chap, uh, cabinet who's not that well known. Maybe you won't know him. He's called uh, Nick Thomas Simmons. And um, he is a historian. He, he taught history, actually, mm -hmm. political mm -hmm. history. And he's written books on prime ministers and all the rest of it. And I, because I'm interested in context, I go and have a few drinks with him every now and again. And, you know, it's kind of people think oh, these people are weird because we go back and 
he compares Rachel Reeves to former chancellors and things of the past. Uh, but no one does that. No one has memory now, you know. Um, and you need memory to make sense of things. Um, so he goes back, you know, when he looks at what Rachel Reeves, Labour's shadow chancellor, is doing and compares it to other Labour figures from in periods of economic recession, which we're in now. Um, and without that, you are you're swimming, you know, in, in, in waves without enough support. And it, you really need context. Now, in the 70s and 80s, you couldn't move for people. Mm -hmm. who were obsessed with contextualizing they were all writing it's a miracle they did anything else um and and it's a shame that we haven't got that with the current politicians mm -hmm. they're not to be honest they're not that interesting the current lot. <laughs> um and uh i mean whatever else johnson was very interesting and he's a complex character um but yeah I, and I don't quite know why it is that they are, on the whole, insubstantial. Um, this concludes our conversation in this room, but we can carry on in the reception afterwards until six o'clock. Um, I bet you didn't know that Steve is such a good mimic. Um, that's part of his stage activity, a bit like Charles Dickens, who uh, came to Newcastle as a blue plaque above uh, Cafe Royal, uh, giving public talks uh, and being in the guise of his characters. Um, I've another... sold as many books as Dickens, actually. <laughs> another thing that Steve does, um, very much like AJP Taylor uh, in the 60s and 70s, the historian, who would walk onto live TV and deliver a lecture for half an hour without notes, straight to camera. Uh, is Steve done the same thing of the BBC about politicians and prime ministers? Uh, it's a great talent. Uh, it's very rare. And one reason it works is that the viewer trusts him. Um, and I hope you found today's talk equally inspiring. So please join me in thanking. Thank you. Brilliant questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>